such a corrupting force in this town. I want to see him behind bars. If you want to delve deeper, I can show you the way. No, I'll be gone. Sharon? What's up? Sorry, I'm late. I'm leaving, you know, for good. I wanted to say goodbye. Where are you going to go? And congrats on the movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, I know that it was adapted from your um, uh, radio drama series, Tales from Beyond the Pale. And I was wondering if it was a natural progression from the radio to then make it into a movie, or given your love of universal monsters, um, was it always, um, you know, in the plan for you to make a werewolf picture? Without a doubt. Uh, you know, it's a little known story, but I went to Miramax in the 80s and I begged them to make uh, Werewolf by Night, which was a comic book written by Marvel in the 70s that I grew up on. And uh, I, I particularly loved the first couple of issues and uh, the art of Mike Plug, And that's a flat face werewolf with, with a great physique. And uh, kind of a cool storyline and the great. Um, so then they, of course, said, certainly not. <laughs> then I went to, uh, then when VHS was was uh, finding filmmakers, I submitted my sort of idea as a, well, it would have been weird. It was a found footage. I can't even remember. I think I must have the script, but somehow I turned it into a found footage, which just shows I was, really insisting on making this and then i did a thing called fear itself and i pitched them my werewolf movie they said no because they, they made me make a wendigo movie instead uh called skin and bones with doug jones uh but anyway just trying to tell you the lineage of a film it stays with you for a long time and then i did the uh, radio play just because i as usual we were on a deadline it always happens with the radio plays they're like oh damn i gotta come up with something we're we're literally going live in uh, next week so i made it there and it was the central scene that i always had in mind uh of, of well spoiler alert but a guy turning into a werewolf when he's driving a very inconvenient time uh, and then um and you know i liked how that went and uh and then eventually i just said it's time to make the feature yeah i mean obviously with werewolf by night obviously marvel picked it up in there a couple of years ago and um released it to, for streaming so you were far ahead of the of, of the curve in, in terms of that so the fact that you've continued to persist with that and you've you've had that seed constantly growing away is is brilliant um one of the things that i really enjoyed was the opening of the movie because although it's full of the usual sort of genre tropes you've got some you know there's a couple having this yes, sex nudity and a, a good lashing of gore what follows on after that though is is complete it is a completely different movie um and i was wondering if it was a conscious choice on your part to wrong foot the audience at the beginning uh, well, you know, it's called the cold open, and Jaws has it. A lot of most of the, uh, a lot of the beloved films have it. Although most of my movies, I go the opposite way, where I I like the slow burn into the horror, where in fact you're in a daily life thing, uh, and you're almost getting impatient because you're like, why am I watching this? And then you slowly learn that it's a vampire story. You know, that's how I approached my film called Habit. However, for this. The whole idea of being a werewolf is that you have sort of this secret that you're carrying around with you. And so I wanted the audience to be aware of what's worrying him and what he's sort of facing. And so there's, you know, there's calendars and other indications that maybe his time has come around. But that killing we have in the beginning is presumably from some time ago, which is to say a month or maybe two or three months. But in, you know, in the moon cycle. Uh, it starts with a full moon. And then, you know, as you drift through the uh, the room and meet this character, you actually see uh, a calendar with, you know, some feverish circles around some date. So maybe you're getting wind. Oh, I see. I get what's going on. So this guy must be the werewolf. So I, I also designed the movie 
uh, not to fetishize the mystery of who the werewolf is. That's for other films and, and always fun. There's a movie called Silver Bullet where you don't know who the werewolf in the town is. That's all good. Uh, but I was doing something different because I like to, um, my approach is to relate to the monster and the dilemma they have. And in this case, he's got a curse and it's coming around again. So I, and even though some people feel impatient with, you know, when are we getting back to the monster story? My point is that every scene, every interaction is haunted by the fact that he's, yeah, this thing is about, it's going to happen. Uh, so that's sort of what I'm playing. Yeah. And the one thing that I love about your work is the characterization that, that you put in. So even in that opening scene, which in a lot of movies would be kind of throwaway, you have the couple sort of having a back and forth chat and getting all excited and you're, you're already into them as characters. You've already got a feel for who they are. And then they're killed off, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, exciting and, and disappointing at the same time. And you have that, you know, um, all the way through your movies, that great characterization. And that's something that I loved. And speaking of great characters, I thought Charlie, who's at the center, um, uh, was um, really well played, so, quite soulfully, I thought, by Alex Hurt. And um, obviously he's in the midst of this really hairy existential crisis. And I was, um, <laughs> and, um, I was wondering um, how his casting and involvement came about, because I know you've got like um, a, a, a sort of group of friends with, within the industry. So we've got sort of Barbara Crampton, for example, and Joe Swanberg popping up here. Um, was Alex already within the Fessenden family or was he uh, newly brought into the fold on this movie? Well, actually he was. And I tribute my son discovered him, so to speak, uh, because my son made a war film called Foxhole when he was a young guy, 19 or something. And um, he um, he uh, had a casting agent named Lois Strapkin who brought Alex in for a reading. And, and Jack uh, really liked uh, Alex's work. And so I was the producer on that movie. So I got to meet Alex and I hung out with him, you know, between takes of my son's film. And uh, we were talking and he said that, you know, he was motivated to become an actor because of Boris Karloff and the Cheney character. And I was just like, oh, that's so sweet. Um, because your father happens to be William Hurt. So you think that was why you're an actor, but actually he had sort of this older origin story and, uh, and an uncle who was a huge proponent of monsters and all of this, which I thought was charming. Uh, but anyway, we talked about other things and alcoholism and, and you know, uh, difficult, overbearing fathers. And so I realized this is my, this is the character. This is the the, the tragedy or the, 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 the nuance that I wanted in a modern version of the, the Wolfman. You know, somebody who had some, you know, a heaviness to them or, or a melancholy. And so that's how I like to approach these classic tropes is to sort of, uh, rediscover them and, and bring life to them or contemporary uh, sense abilities sensibilities and so he was my guy and that's actually when I realized I could finally make the movie everybody said oh Larry of course you're going to play the werewolf but I'm too old uh it's just would be too dreary um me running around shirtless I can assure you this would be a real hard you don't want to get into at this point so uh you know, I had to pass this uh, precious job on to Alex and he just came through in so many ways and bulked up and or, or bulked down. I don't know how you look at it, but he got really ripped and it was fantastic. And then, you know, cared about the movement and, and really uh, brought, as you say, a soulfulness to this, you know, perhaps it's a preposterous character, but he, you know, as I did, uh, took it seriously and wanted something emotional. Yeah, yeah. I, and it, 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 you've more than succeeded there. I, I, you know, he, um, was the real heart of the movie and there was a lot of, um, emotional conveyance just through, through his eyes. You could really feel the, the weight that he was, his character, you know, his character was car uh, carrying, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you mentioned his father, William, and I thought what was an, a particularly nice touch was, where we see um, photographs in the film where he's talking about this, you know, we're going back through his own father and it's actually him and and William. Whose idea was that? Was that yours or did that come from Alex? Um, it's funny, in the Q&As, we did a couple Q&As, he says it was his idea to suggest it. And I think obviously the fact that the photos existed 
Yeah, so it was entirely his idea. He said, I have these old pictures, shall we use them? And of course I was a little, well, I don't want to impose and I don't want to abuse the old man and uh, your guys' history. And But honestly, uh, whether or not it was William Hurt, there's nothing more exciting than the real, real photos from the past and, you know, and then there's something about them that are so striking, just the individual moments that you see, and you really see Alex growing up. And then the final, um, you know, cherry on top is that this is William Hurt, who has his own history to bring uh, to the viewer. So um, we we remember, uh, obviously, altered states, but but all of those were yeah. even even towards the end, uh, some great turns. So I, I think it gave it depth. And because the son is haunted by the dad and it's in the movie, all this talk about my father, this and that, and he's friends with this guy. And so it actually allows the audience to sort of bring a little more history than they would just through dialogue. Yeah. Like that. They're like, oh, but it's it's William Hurt. I've seen all his pictures. <laughs> so uh, I, it was it couldn't have been more beautiful, but it came very organically through Alex making the offer. Lovely. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about the werewolf design, which I thought was was great in terms of the FX and, and, and the look. Now, compared to other um, sort of werewolf designs, so for example, this chap on my T-shirt here. Oh, um, yeah, you've been teasing me this whole time. You think I didn't notice? <laughs> well, I, I thought I'd wear something of, um, of, of suitably appropriate. Apologies, for, you know, I haven't got any merch for your own movie, but... Um, I thought I'd get in, get into the mood. Um, <laughs> the design, as I say, is quite minimalist, and I was wondering if that was um, to do with specifically allowing Alex um, a greater range of flexibility to display emotion, as well as the physical feats that um, you know when he's in uh, transforms into the werewolf, he has to um to do i mean there's a lot of him running through the woods and jumping and obviously with a lot of heavy prosthetics that's going to be difficult to do so was that where you were where you were coming from on that yes i mean a lot of people assume it's a budgetary thing and you know that's to be determined there, there's obviously little things one might have done with more money but the bottom line is this is my aesthetic is a wolf man as i say it comes from that comic book as well as lon cheney but even the choice to have him wear shoes was weirdly practical. But also, I, I'm never a fan when you see the werewolf movie and they show the, the boot being torn to pieces by the toes. I mean, you know, it depends on how far you want your creature to be departing from the physical form, uh, the human form. I like the idea of, um, especially in this film, when Alex got really buff, we we threw away the idea of even having like a little fur suit. We imagined tight spandex fur suit. And I was like, I don't want to, this happened already on a film called Wendigo that I made. Uh, we ended up with a very furry creature and all the articulation of the model they made underneath this rubber model uh, was lost and I was forever ruined by it. So I wouldn't repeat that mistake. And finally, it is ultimately a psychological movie. I don't think it's as ambiguous as my movie Habit, where you don't know if the guy is just crazy or if his wife, girlfriend is a is a is a vampire. But here again, I always want to play on the I'm trying to celebrate the fact that these are stories about uh, psychological dilemmas that people suffer, these monster stories. And, you know, there's a wonderful uh, metaphor in play, which is like a man turns into a wolf at night. But the, the truth is, is that I wanted to remain grounded that, you know, this is a guy who's been kicked out of the house by the girlfriend. When he comes to her house, it's as much uh, a home invasion by your ex-lover as it is a werewolf movie. And I wanted to always feel that. Um, and and then the final confrontation has a similar, just very human, uh, <laughs> bad breakup kind of vibe so you're right you can feel alex's performance through it and there's there's bewilderment even i would argue and i mean you might not have the graphic but i i did make a poster and i put the werewolf on the poster it's because i'm like this isn't a movie where you know you're gonna wait for 20 minutes and then i'm gonna show you my monster it's like come in and let's see what else this movie has to offer because it's not about the incredible prosthetics Having said that, I love the personality of the the makeup that was created yeah. by years and, and Peter Gurner. You know, it's very much what I wanted. We worked very hard on that, and you know, it was a great collaboration. And 
we knew the mission. And um, so that, that was sort of the background of the, of the creature. And even the movement was, was designed uh, carefully to uh, conform to some ideas I had had about, you know, <laughs> a creature movement. I'm very obsessed with this kind of ang uh, animalistic thing. So all of that combined is what you get. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, worked, it worked really well. Um, speaking of, um, you know, sort of, uh, 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 you know, a lot being worked in um, to the scripts, um, you pack a lot into a relatively short runtime. You know, we've obviously got the main main story through through line where you know it can be seen as a metaphor for alcoholism and um, things like that. But you've you've got uh, uh, there's a uh, I think there's a mention of like Black Lives Matter, the um, exploitation of um, low paid um, immigrant workers. Uh, I, th I think there was some LGBTQ stuff. I think at one point. I mean, there's there's a lot in there, and what I, I know you like to kind of shoot. I've read specific, you know, right for this one in particular that you'd like to shoot sort of fairly loose and and go with the flow. So I was wondering how much of that was already in the original script and how much of it was kind of built in as, as things progressed. It just felt naturally right to put it in. The movie is about a werewolf. A werewolf is a guy that is a person during the day and then a couple nights a, a month, he turns into a mad creature. And uh, werewolf movies, sometimes they can remember, sometimes they can't. But the bottom line is there's a divided personality there. You know, you're, you're two things and you're trying to reconcile that. And I feel in, a, in our country, I think you have the same problems over there, is, uh, you know, uh, everybody is uh, divided in our country. So to me, uh, bringing all these themes in is not just trying to pack in a bunch of trendy um, issues of the day. It's really talking about the condition we find ourselves in, where we are divided, and it's because of um, uh, mistrust and a fracturing of information. We've lost a, a, a common storyline. And, and so I, I'm just trying to portray that, and people are... Um, T taking advantage of, of paranoias about immigrants and there's just abuses in our society that are you know becoming more and more pronounced and and they'd all tracks with the werewolf story in my opinion so to me it isn't like overstuffed i'm inviting the audience to make connections between all the issues that concern us uh nowadays and realize, you know, it's all the same thing. It's a lack of ability to get along with each other, to find the humanity in each other, uh, to to have empathy, and and to have connection. So that's really my message: is like, get your shit together, people. We got to learn to get along. And so, if it seems like a lot of different, weird, ah, oh, what are the gay guys doing? And why, you know, what's the? There's a Mexican here, and I, I, Fezzanin's talking about environmentalism. Well, my point is, it's all connected. I disagree that these are single year or, you know, I'm not saying with you, but I'm just saying they're not disparate issues. We're, we're mishandling our future. <laughs> we're mishandling our society. Uh, yeah. We're having the wrong arguments. And um, so I, I throw them all in, not, not like to just sort of appear, you know, uh, with the times. I think this is, uh, it's the Tower of Babel that we're confronting now and you know obviously that's with social media and so on so i take a small town i show that it's divided one of the smartest most wonderful people in the movie is the priest you know which is another yeah that's contrary to a modern if you will uh liberal-minded uh filmmaker you know you'd think oh well organized religion is the downfall of this town well i'm saying well you know at least he's got a perspective uh so uh i i even that is a surprise i think um and one which i enjoy building with my uh with my actor uh john sparadakis so just mm -hmm. to finish the thought uh most of it was absolutely scripted and all these themes were were baked into my conceit uh the one kids that um did bring a little more than i had written to the table with my encouragement were the uh the two assholes who uh you know, they decide to record the uh, <laughs> the Mexican dude, and you know they're so they end up their work. But what I wanted was two uh, friends, sort of Trumpy types, who were sort of scheming and they were conspiratorial, 
But the fundamental thing is in the beginning, one of them says, I will never uh, leave you. You're my best pal. It's like we're like soldiers and all of that. And then in the end, there's just this very small, but it's like a microaggression where he completely has abandoned him uh, to, to be with the cooler, older guy, James LeGrand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I invite the audience to track all those, if you will, microaggressions and say, you know, what is what is the commonality here? Well, it's people not really respecting or uh, caring for each other. And that's where we're going to lose our shit on a, on a big level and on a small level. And you touched on in, um, the environment there, and I know it's something that you visited with the last winter. Is that... Um... Uh, an issue that's particularly close to your heart or is it again something you just felt was right for um all of the uh, you know all of the sort of um, issues that you you broach in in the movie well it's all of the above you know as a filmmaker i just i am sort of a collagist almost you know but to me if they if they relate to each other different themes can play together it's not uncommon, of course, for a uh, patriarch who runs a town and, you know, has a lot of influence. And I guess he runs the lumber store, but he's also trying to build a resort somewhere and he's trying to exploit the local uh, Mexicans who have come there for the low paying jobs. And then he's turning it on them and saying they're responsible for angst in the town. And this is exactly what goes on. And I can tell you that the discussion that is in the movie is something that happened in our town. There's somebody wanted to build a golf course on a mountain. Well, the problem with that is that in order to build the, the grass with the golf course, you're going to have um, pesticide runoff and it's going to get into the groundwater. So it's exactly what happened. I'm, I'm not yeah. making it up in order to scold everyone and teach them a lesson. I'm saying this is what, this is capitalism in America. And also, I guess it's a spoiler alert, but what I think is funny is that the werewolf uses his werewolfness to get the revenge. Now that hasn't, I haven't seen that in a movie. I've seen other stuff that I do in a movie, but I think that's fantastic. If you were a werewolf, uh, you might say, I want to be really next to my enemy when the, <laughs> when the, <laughs> <get himself. laughs> I mean, you know, the movie is also has a sense of humor because it's a werewolf. Movie, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, 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 it's got that lovely balance of humor and, um, uh, sort of social commentary and it all it all comes together really really nicely um in terms of transformation sequences again your your film um doesn't take the the, the sort of classic route and you've what we've got is some lovely animations um and some i found them particularly disturbing the kind of uh portrait side of it um going through the, the, that transformation as well was that something again you consciously wanted and or was that more to do with budgetary constraints with the with the fx no again if i had well whatever a million dollars if i had 10 million whatever <laughs> million, um i would have done this i might have done it uh better or i might have pushed my idea further and yet the exact idea that the the, the painting in the movie goes from uh, pictures of trees to a more diseased, more self-obsessed uh, yeah. literature, and then eventually Francis Bacon blurred paintings, and all of that was mapped out with my wonderful painter uh, John Mitchell. So this was, you know, tracking the the artistic psychology of the character as he becomes more uh, disturbed mm -hmm. and obsessed. He becomes, if you will, a modern artist painter uh, from from a more uh, reverential painter of of you know quiet nature scene so i wanted that uh, to happen and then the other thing uh, i've said to um, those who will listen that you know if you freeze a frame during an edit there's a little blur that's the nature of cinema uh even in digital photography and you know you can affect the um the frame rate so you can get a little bit more blur so in a weird way i use the old tradition from lon cheney of animating a uh, a, a transformation you know they put a little more fur on him and then a little more but he's very still yeah. lying on classically a plastic uh, a plaster uh, pillow so that his head is in the same place so i wanted to do the opposite and say never mind you know if you do little teeny jump cuts in movies you'd be surprised how the eye just carries it on so i said mm -hmm. let's try that and so suddenly we had a very loose opportunity to do a transformation and use those little blurs 
and slowly add makeup. Um, and, and, and that was how I wanted to treat this. Uh, it's almost like uh, uh, documentary style uh, werewolf transformation, which is very much my whole thing. It's like, what would it really be like uh, rather than fetishize it as we've done in the yep. eight with the hand going, you know, all that. Uh, let's try something different and maybe disarming. So it's budget. I mean, it's not budget. It's it's, it's ideas first. I, I always say to my filmmakers because I produce movies, uh, I I don't let we don't have to talk about the budget. What is the idea you have? And then I you know you, maybe you can't do that, but you you want to start with the idea. Yeah, and it worked really wonderfully. I, it was it was very refreshing to see um, the the animated approach, and I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Although, as I say, the, the Francis Bacon type of uh, imagery did quite upset me a little bit. But I guess that's your job. So, uh, well done. <laughs> um, you touched on um, working with edits, um, and obviously you've directed this. I mean, you're. Um, one of um, the filmmaking world's multi-hyphenates. I mean, on Blackout Alone, you wrote, directed, produced, and edited. I think, am I right saying your voice is there somewhere in the in the movie as well? Uh, I can't remember, is it? I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I'm in the beginning, but I don't even think I credit myself. Yeah, I'm the radio. And you know what's sweet is that yeah. what I'm saying, it's very muted. Maybe when I do the the Blu-ray or whatever, I'll 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 unmute it um, because I'm saying uh, you have to go see Ty West Triggerman and uh, Graham Morris. <laughs> so I'm, I'm acting like it's a few days before Halloween, so I'm doing class eye titles and saying they're all going to be playing at the drive-in. So that is my game. <laughs> oh, um. What <laughs> coming back to my question? Sorry, I've completely lost my train of thought. Then, given um, that, like all of us, you're not getting in any younger. I'm, I hope you don't mind me saying. That. I think you're what 61 now, right? So, yeah. Where is where is the energy still coming? Where where is that drive? What fuels your fire to to be as prolific as you are and 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 be so um, you know to excel in so many different fields. Well, I don't know if I'm excelling, but I am carrying on. It's true. And I'm sure I'll run out of steam. Uh, I, I am very uh, passionate and about uh, this art form. And and I want to work quickly. I mean, well, I want to work cheaply because I want to work quickly. I spent nine years trying to raise the money for Depraved and realized this isn't going anywhere. And so I abandoned ship and I made it for less. I was lucky to find the money I did. And now I've made this werewolf picture. I want to make the next picture within the next year and get on with it. I mean, I am getting old and I'm notoriously a homebody. I hate traveling and and, and all the, you know, uh, I just want to sit in, on the porch with a beer and, and look at the trees. That's really my nature. But uh, I am I also want to see some of these ideas on film. So I have to keep going out there. It's it's so annoying. Uh, so I'm I'm <laughs> It is the, the only comfort in being 60, which there's none, but the, the the tiny one I can find is that people start retiring at this age. So I really could yeah. quit. My favorite actor uh, from the old days was James Cagney and he quit at 61 and that was it. He just said, fuck yeah. it. So I don't know, that's part of me, but uh, it's also, it's cool to see this stuff realized. I mean, how lucky am I to have made a Frankenstein movie and a Wolfman movie? I mean, my gracious. Uh, it's hard to resist. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that brings me um, rather nicely, actually, to my uh, last question. Um, you've covered uh, Frankenstein's monster. You've uh, mentioned Habit earlier, you vampire, and now we've got Wolfman. Are we going to see the, uh, uh, you know, a Larry Fessenden mummy movie in the next year? You know, the world is divided into two types of people. One asked me if I'm going to make a mummy movie, which I am not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I don't know what the other group is, but the, what I am going to do is I'm going to put all the monsters in one movie. That's what uh, that to me is more fun and well, more, be cool. more of a challenge. Uh, the mummy thing, I, you know, I always say I wouldn't dream of it because I never cared for the mummy. But if I was paid to do it, I mean, I actually maybe there would be a way to make a pheasant and mummy movie, but I don't know what it would be. <laughs> it would be in a museum. It'd be cool, uh, but. 
anyway, no, it's funny. Everyone asks that. I, I much prefer the creature from the Black Lagoon. My absolute, well, I have many favorites, but that's such a beautiful creature. Obviously, Guillermo has done sort of a retread on that, uh, but I don't think the original uh, creature design can be improved on. Um, hmm. It is, to me, perfection and beautiful, and uh, the swimming scenes in those movies are... Anyway, so I, I wouldn't even know what to do. That's an environmental parable. I don't see what you'd need to change. And the hmm. two dudes with their shirts off, it's already got a, a gay uh, theme, so it's very contemporary. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that movie, I think I'll leave it alone. But uh, I love The Invisible Man. I had a great script by a guy named J.T. Petty uh, that was yeah. fantastic. We spent quite a long time trying to make it. Um, I would love to see that made. Uh, but my own universe, I'm going to see if it's possible to mash it up. Yeah, I I, I think um, no, you've, you've sold me on that. Um, really really like that um so thank you so much larry for sparing me some time it's been wonderful chatting to you and hopefully we'll have a chat um when we've got a real uh, monster mash of a movie uh, up next <laughs> very good i'll see you soon i hope <laughs> yeah absolutely take care my friend okay dude ciao you're really a werewolf i'd rather be dead <laughs> charlie Stay with me, man! I can't wait to see your face when you realize what's happening. Oh!